Okay, everybody, uh, thank you for coming. And uh, tonight, uh, Baruch Hashem, we have uh, many, many dedications. Uh, first, a Rafur Shlema for Pua Rachel Bat Ayelet, Braya Bat Chava, Chaim Arye Ben Rifka, Moshe Zev Ben Gita, Ephraim Ben Abigail, and Baruch Elio Yechiel Ben Ilana Gittel, and Be'ezus Hashem, uh, may all of them have a Rafur Shlema Betoch Sharchol Yisrael. Uh, in addition, uh, the shir tonight is in memory of Carl, which is Einar Ben. I can't remember. Ben Bo Torah. Einar Ben Bo Torah. Uh, Abel Ben Abel. Chaim Yitzchak Ben Naftali. Again, may uh, the shir be an Eloi Neshama uh, for all of them. Uh, in addition, uh, Yibaneh wants to thank all of those who have participated and gave contributions to the end of the year fundraising campaign, uh, Tiskel and Mitzvos, and may uh, all of the blessings for those who support projects of the spreading of Torah be upon the contributors and their families. And uh, Rabbi Poston reminds me that uh, even after the uh, year is over, it's a new year, one can always contribute and dedicate classes and programs throughout the year. So. The fundraising is not over when the campaign is over. There, the needs are constantly there. And thank you again in advance for any assistance that you can give uh, to this very worthy cause. I apologize if my uh, voice is a little low tonight. Uh, for some reason, I uh, went to Tzvat for the weekend for Thor Sameach, and apparently, uh, at my age, even that is too much of a trip. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I have a kind of a bad cold. But hopefully, we'll be able to get through get through the uh, get through the shear. Uh, we are uh, today was of course Asara Beteves, and um, before I, I talk about the parsha, which is which is which is, which is what I want to do, I just want to share a very quick thought about Asara Beteves that's very fascinating. And uh, this is a chiddush that Rav Yosef Cairo, the base Yosef, brings in the name of Rav David Abu Draham, who was one of the great Rishonim, whose expertise was in tefillah and minhagim of uh, customs of tefillah. And the Abu Draham says the following idea. Uh, we know that if any other fast other than Yom Kippur falls out on Shabbos, we do not fast. If, if the ninth of Av falls out on Shabbos, we will observe the fast uh, Saturday night and Sunday. We will not fast on Shabbos. But the Abu Draham says, if the tenth of Teves were to fall out on Shabbos, the tenth of Teves would override Shabbos, and we would actually fast even on Shabbos. Now, uh, interestingly, this is an untestable proposition, because based on the configuration of the Jewish calendar, the tenth of Teves can never call it, fall out on Shabbos. So there's no way to prove the Abu Dram right or prove him wrong, because it just cannot happen. Based on when Rosh Hashanah can be, the tenth of Tevis will never be on Shabbos. But in theory, if the tenth of Tevis would be on Shabbos, we would even fast. Now the question is, what is so unique about the tenth of Tevis? I mean, after all, the only thing that happened on the tenth of Tevis was the siege against Yerushalayim started. Nothing happened, there was no war, there was no casualty, there was no destruction. If any fast were to override Shabbos, I would have thought maybe it's the ninth of Av, which is the actual day of the Chorban Bayis Rishon and the Chorban Bayis Sheni. Why should the tenth of Teves have a distinction and a Chumrah and a strictness about it that you don't even have for Tisha B'Av itself? So the Chassam Seifer uh, gives a very, very beautiful and interesting explanation. The Chassam Seifer points out that although you're generally not allowed to fast on Shabbos, there is actually one major, besides Yom Kippur, there is one major exception where you do fast on Shabbos, or you can fast on Shabbos, and that is a tainus chalom. A tainus chalom is if a person had Friday night, a bad dream, a dream of tragedy, a dream of, of death, or whatever it would be, so the minog was that a person should fast to be mavatel, 
whatever evil decree that dream has. So a tainus for a chalaim, you can do even on Shabbos. Although it's an interesting halacha, you're allowed to fast even on Shabbos, but as an atonement for the sin of fasting on Shabbos, you have to have an extra fast during the week to make up for that Avera. So on one hand it's mutter, on the other hand you need an atonement for fasting on Shabbos. So the halacha is though that a tainus chalom is mutter on Shabbos. Why is that so? So the Chassam Sefer differentiates between fasting over tragedies that have happened in the past and fasting in order to avert a tragedy from happening in the future. The ninth of Av, Shivas or Batamas is all about past tragedies. So we don't mourn past tragedies on Shabbos, just like Shiva itself. Essentially, you don't observe the Shiva restrictions on Shabbos because Shabbos is not a time for mourning. Now, the tainus of a chalom, the tainus of a chalom is not about a tragedy that has happened. It's in order to avert a tragedy from happening. It's preventative. It is anticipatory. That type of fast you're allowed to do. So says the Chassam Seifer, even though we would normally view Asara Beteves the same way we would view Tisha B'av, it's a fast about a past tragedy, in which case you wouldn't be allowed to fast on Shabbos. But he says there's an aspect of Asara Beteves that is future looking. It is said, the Chassam Seifer writes, that Asara Beteves is the Rosh Hashanah of the Beis Hamikdash, meaning to say, just as every Rosh Hashanah, Hashem decides who will live and who will die. On Asara Beteves, he decides for the coming year, will the Beis HaMikdash be rebuilt or will it not? So we're fasting not only to mourn something that happened in the past, but we're fasting similar to Yom Kippur, that Hashem should forgive our sins and have a favorable decree for the Binyan Beis HaMikdash. And that is why, indeed, you could do that even on Shabbos. In fact, Yom Kippur itself indicates that, that when you're fasting, not to commemorate or remember some tragedy, but in order to prevent some future misfortune from occurring, that you're allowed to do. That's essentially what Yom Kippur is. That is a Tainus Chalom. And the Chassam Seifer wants to say that that is the idea of Tzom, of Tzom Gedalia. Uh, I'm sorry, of, of Asar Rabbi Tevis. <coughs> okay, so now though, we, we're in the last part of Bracious. And uh, Sefer Bracious is full of so many interesting, difficult, deep stories and narratives and family connections. Certainly if you're a family therapist, you can write books and books and books based on Chumash Bracious and the like. But we finally come to the end of Yaakov Avinu's life. And Yaakov had a quite an eventful life and quite a difficult life. Uh, but the last 17 years of his life, from the age of 130 to the age of 147, where he died, he spent in Mitzrayim, surrounded by all of his sons, especially Yosef, <coughs> from whom he had been separated for 22 years. And at the very end of his life, he gathers together all of his sons in order to give each one a bracha. And the bracha does not only pertain to them as individuals, but as each one is the founder of a tribe. The bracha that he's giving is identifying the fundamental nature of that tribal unit. Now this itself is a very significant point about the meaning of community and the meaning of unity. It's very, very clear throughout the Torah that the concept of tribal affiliation is quite significant. Meaning, the tribes had their own nisim, their own heads of tribes, they had their own flags, they had their own position in the desert. When they come to Eretz Yisrael, they will have their own portions of land. This is Reuben's land, this is Yisachar's land, this is Yehuda's land. Uh, and tribal affiliation is a very, very significant point of identification. And both Yaakov and Moshe Rabbeinu give brachos based on the tribal level. They don't just bless the Jewish people. Now one might wonder, why do we make a big deal about tribes after all? Aren't we introducing just another 
disunity concept. I mean, uh, you know, we, we have enough that we fight over. So now, uh, all right, so today, because we don't really know our tribes, unless you're a Kohen or a Levi, so we don't really have tribal affiliation that much. So we're not going to be fighting, oh, I'm Yehuda and you're Yisachar, whatever it is. But when those divisions existed, they were very, very significant. In fact, the Ramban actually writes that they were responsible for a civil war. In the book of Judges, Sefer Shoftim, we read that a woman was raped and murdered, essentially, in the Chelek of Binyamin, and the other tribes demanded extradition of the wrongdoer, bin, or the wrongdoers. Shevet Binyamin refused to deliver the wrongdoers because they said other tribes have no jurisdiction over crimes that were committed within a tribal boundary, and they fought a war over this very similar to the American Civil War, which was fought over cessation controversies. And thousands and thousands of people got killed. So why does the Torah even make a big deal? Couldn't we just have had that, uh, you know, Yaakov is the founder of the Jewish people, and we are B'nai Yaakov, or we are B'nai Yisrael, and that's all. Why is there any importance at all to the notion of tribes? And the answer is, the Torah is teaching us something very, very important about the meaning of unity and community. That unity and community is not sameness and conformity. Yes, every Jew who is part of the faith community of Israel has a common responsibility of Torah and mitzvot. That's the common denominator. But within that parameter, within that framework, we have to develop individuality. We have to develop the uniqueness of our relationship. The way Ruvain served Hashem is not the way Shimon did it. Each tribe represented a uniqueness in the particular way that they served HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to create a community that is not based on conformity, but a community that celebrates difference Diversity, now again, I realize that these are buzzwords. When you hear in modern society, diversity, typically they're talking about transgender, abortion, gay marriage, and the like. I, I do not mean that. But I mean within the framework of Judaism. We have to have an appreciation for the fact that people are different. We are individuals. Tribal units highlight the idea, as the Medrash says, that the beauty of a garden is not when you simply have one color flower. There are gardens like that. But for most people, the beauty of a garden are different flowers, different textures, different smells, different colors. That creates beauty. So people ask sometimes, when Mashiach comes, are we still going to have Ashkenazim and Svardim? And of course, Ashkenazim and Svardim, each of them subdivide into numerous groups. Right? With Svartim, you have Moroccans and Tunisians and Syrians and Iraqis and Iranians. And among Ashkenazim, you have Yekis, you have German and uh, Polish and uh, whatever, Hungarian, uh, Czechoslovakian. I mean, there's no country in Czechoslovakia anymore, but they used to be called Czechoslovakia. Litvak, Litvasha, Lithuanian. So all of this disunity, all of this machlokas, <coughs> is that going to appear? Is that going to disappear when Mashiach comes? I don't know, but I would suspect it would not disappear. Because although these things are bad if they turn into sources of rancor and disagreement, if each one has respect for what the other one is doing, it actually becomes a more beautiful way to serve Hashem with all of these different colors and hues. And this is the significance of tribes. Tribes remind us that community is not the same as conformity. Achtus is not the same as homogeneity. There can and should be diversity, different ways of doing things. And this is highlighted in Yaakov Avinu's brachos. Each shevet is given a different bracha. Each shevet is given a different destiny. Each shevet has a different strength. And this is an issue that's very, very relevant, uh, not only in Klal Yisrael as a whole, but it's very relevant in terms of uh, how we raise our children and how we teach our children in school. Shlomo HaMelech said, Chanoch l'nar al pi darko. You have to train a child according to their personality. Chinuch should not be a one-size-fit-all situation. Rather, we have to be able to speak to the individual uniqueness of the person that we're dealing with. Whether it's our child, 
whether it's our students, <coughs> everybody knows, every parent is a teacher, and every teacher should try to be somewhat of a parent at the same, at the same time, right? My father is my teacher, my teacher is my father. Okay, so that's uh, point number one about the Birchas Yaakov, even before you get into the specifics of the brachos. The fact that Yaakov Avinu envisions a tribal division of Am Yisrael highlights the notion that within community there has to be diversity and there has to be difference. Now, Chazal tells us a very interesting thing. That when Yaakov's sons gathered together, Yaakov wanted to reveal to them, this is Rashi brings this, when Mashiach is coming. He was going to tell them when Mashiach is coming. When will the Geula be? But then Hashem made him forget it. Hashem took away the knowledge. He was going to reveal it and it was taken away from him. So the Medrash has a whole dialogue that's not in the Chumash in which Yaakov said to his children, perhaps Hashem has taken this knowledge away from me because you're not worthy. You don't fully believe in Hashem. You don't fully accept Hashem's commandments. So the Medrash says that all of the tribes answered Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Now you have to understand what the Medrash is doing here. Shema Yisrael is a Pasuk in, in Parshas V'yashana and it's in the Torah, it's in Devarim and Shema Yisrael refers to the nation of Israel. Here, nation of Israel, there's only one God. But Yisrael is also Yaakov's name. <laughs> so according to the Medrash this Pasuk was first said by the tribes when Yaakov accused them or Yaakov suspected that perhaps they were not totally loyal to Hashem, they said, listen, Yisrael. That, that's a big question. How can they call their father by his first name? That's a question. But, but the Medrash says they mean his first name. Listen, Yisrael. Hashem alokeinu. Hashem is our God. Hashem is one. There's only one God. Our heart is whole. Our faith is full. And then it is said that Yaakov responded in gratitude, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuso Leolam Bo'ed. That's what we say after Shema Yisrael. It's not in the Torah. But we say, Blessed is the glorious name of God forever and ever. This was Yaakov's gratitude at being reassured that his sons had Emuna Shalema in Hashem. Yaakov responded, Baruch Shem. So the Gemara in Pesachim uh, has an interesting discussion. There are actually two different sources for the origin of Baruch Shem. One is because that's what Yaakov said when his son said Shema Yisrael to reassure him. So one source connects it to Yaakov. There's another source that when Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Shemayim to receive the Torah, he heard the Malachim saying, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchus Olam Vaed. And this was such a beautiful praise that Moshe stole it from the Malachim. And he taught it to Bnei Yisrael at earth. Now the Gemara says, that is why we say, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchus quietly, because we don't want the angels to get jealous by hearing us saying it out loud. Except on Yom Kippur, we can say it out loud because we are like the Malacha Yashares. So the Gemara says, we can't not say it at all because Yaakov Avinu said it. But we don't say it because Ram, because apparently it got forgotten and Moshe reclaimed it from the Malachim. We don't want the Malachim to be, to be jealous. So Baruch Shem is always said silently. Again, let me remind you, Baruch Shem is not in the Kriya Shema in the Torah. When you look at <coughs> Shema Yisrael Hashem Elkeinu Hashem Echad, the next Pasuk is V'yahavta. Baruch Shem is not a Pasuk. Baruch Shem is not in the Torah at all. And yet, we know that Yaakov said it and Moshe took it from the Malachim. In fact, even on Yom Kippur itself, you can really get a sense of the transitions. On Yom Kippur, we say Baruch Shem out loud because we are like the angels on Yom Kippur. So, at the end of Ne'ilah, you finished Chazar Sashatz and you finished Avinu Malkeinu. So what do you say at the end, right before the shofar blowing, the end of Yom Kippur? 
We say, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. We say it once. And then we say, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuso Leolam Boed. Three times we say it out loud. We say it out loud. We're still in Yom Kippur. It's still Neila. And then, um, uh, we, we say uh, Hashem Hu Elokim seven times, etc. And then we have Kaddish. And then we have blowing shofar. And right after blowing shofar, maybe you dance a little bit, but right after blowing shofar, we start Myriff, weekday Myriff. Right? You never get you never get excused. You'd figure a whole day of Yom Kippur, maybe they can give, let me off for Myriff. No? <laughs> weekday Myriff, gotta do weekday Myriff. In the weekday Myriff, when we say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, Baruch Shem is already said silently. It's quite amazing. It's almost like a kick in the stomach there. Because you see you're no longer an angel. A minute ago. Baruch Shem Kavod Malchus Olam Vayet. And a minute later, I can't say it because I'm not an angel. And I can't steal it from the angel. So you see like, Bechush, you see viscerally this notion of losing Madrigas. Now, it's interesting that uh, one of the commentaries points out that Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuso Leolam Vo'ed um, if you translate it into Aramaic we know that we say Kaddish, right? Kaddish requires a minion. And there are many different types of Kaddishes. Mourner's Kaddish and the whole Kaddish and the half Kaddish and Kaddish Rabbanan, but the basic structure is the same. And the most important part of Kaddish is the uh, statement, Yehei Shmei Rabba Mivarach Li'olam Uli'omei Omaya. May God's name be blessed forever and ever. Yehei Shmei Rabba Mivarach Li'olam Uli'omei Omaya. The Gemara says, Anyone who answers Yehei Raba with all of his strength, even if there was an evil decree in heaven that was on his head for 70 years, Yehei Shmei Raba has the koach to rip up that evil decree. If it is said, Bechol Kocho. Now there's a machlokas. What does it mean, Kol Kocho, with all of your strength? Some say that means b'chol kavanaso, with all of your intention and concentration. And some say it means quite literally, you scream it out. In some places, like told us, Aaron, you actually, you know, they scream out, Yehei Shmei Rabbah. In fact, even in yeshivas, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's interesting. I remember the very first time I was a day school kid. I was in uh, sixth grade. And we had a class trip to Neri Israel in Baltimore, which is the yeshiva I wound up going to. And one of the things that really shocked me was just hearing Yehei Shmei Rabbah in the yeshiva based medrash compared to what it was uh, in the young Israel or whatever it is. Uh, just a regular yeshiva based medrash. You know, not told us I run, and still it was like so much louder uh, than I was used to. But here's the interesting point about Yehei Shmei Rabbah. Yehei Shmei Rabbah is almost an exact translation of Baruch Shem Kavod. Again, look at this. Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuso. Blessed is the name of the glory of his kingdom. Yehei Shmei Rabba Mavarach. May his great name be blessed. Li'olam Vo'ed forever is Li'olam Uli'olme Omaya. So it's not 100%, but it's a very, very, very close paraphrase of Baruch Shem. So you may ask a very simple question. Baruch Shem, I have to say silently because I took it from the Malachim and they're going to accuse me of stealing it. Yehei Shemei Rabbah, I'm supposed to say loudly. Why am I not afraid of the Malachim seeing that I'm stealing it in translation? Right, so in other words, if Baruch Shem and Yehei Shemei Rabbah are the same, why is Baruch Shem Balachash and Yehei Shmei Rabba Bekol Ram? And the answer is a very ingenious answer. The Gemara says, Masech Shabbos, that although angels do understand all languages, not just Hebrew, angels don't understand Aramaic. 
And uh, why don't they understand the Aramaic? It's not clear. It's kind of a jargon language because Aramaic is close to Hebrew but not quite Hebrew. So Aramaic angels don't understand. Mimela, when I say Baruch Shem in Hebrew, I got to be quiet. When I say Yehoshim Rabbi in Aramaic, I can say it out loud because the Malachim don't know what it is that I'm saying. Why don't they catch on after a while? I'm not sure, but this is one of the Jerusalem that are, that are given. Now, one final point about this, then I, I want to go on to something else. Baruch Shem is not only something that is said in Kriyashma, but in fact, in the Beis HaMikdash, whenever a bracha was recited, instead of answering Amen, Amen was not answered in the Beis HaMikdash. They would answer, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuso Liolam Va'ed. So, for example, uh, there was davening in the base of Mikdash. Every day there was davening. The Kohanim would have a prayer service. So if they would say, Baruch Atah Hashem Shomeya Tefillah, the people would not answer Amen. They would say, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuso Leolam Vod. Because the Ein Onin Amen B'Mikdash, and instead you answer, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuso Leolam Vod. Now why is that so? Why don't you answer Amen in the base of Mikdash? So the Marsha says an interesting thing. There's a well-known Gemara in Maseches Nazir that is often quoted in, in books about uh, davening. Gadol ha'ona amen yosher min amavarich. The one who answers amen to a bracha is even greater than the one who made the bracha. Amen to your bracha is greater than you're making the bracha. How could that be so? Amen just means I affirm, it's true. Why is Amen better than the bracha? So the Marsha gives a little bit of a Kabbalistic explanation that's, but I think it's worthwhile to go over this. He says the following, he says that when we make a bracha, we make the bracha using, we don't pronounce the Shem Havaya, we don't pronounce the Tetgrammaton, we don't pronounce those four letters, we just say Aleph Dalid Nunyud, Adal, right? We just say it that way. That's called Adnus. That's a lower level of Kedusha, a lower level of Hashem's power in the world. Now, the Gematria of Adnus, Aleph Dalid Nun Yud. So what is that? That's um, 5, 55, that's 65, right? Adnus is 65. Yud Ke Vav Ke, which is Havaya, is 26. So Agnus plus Havaya equals 91. 91 is the gematria of Amen. So the Marsha says the reason why answering Amen is greater than the bracha is the bracha was made with the shame Agnus. But Amen adds the shame Havaya to Agnus. And it brings a higher level of godliness into the world. It's like, it's like steroids to the bracha. It adds steroids to the bracha. That's God Allah, Amen, Yeshem, and So then the Marsha says beautifully, with this we understand why there is no reason to say Amen in the Beis HaMikdash. Because in the Beis HaMikdash, every single bracha was said with Yud Kei Vav Kei. They didn't say like we say, Baruch Atah, Adnus Shomeyatvila, they would pronounce the Shem Avaya. People make a mistake, they think it was only done on Yom Kippur. No, the Shem Avaya was pronounced every single day, every single bracha. Now, if the purpose of Amen is to add the Shem Havaya to the Shem Adnus, in the Beis Hamikdash, you didn't need to add the Shem Havaya to the Shem Adnus because the bracha already had the Shem. Havaya. And that's why the Marsha says, Ain onin amen b'mikdash, but instead you say Baruch Shem, because that's always the response when you say Shem Havaya, as we see on Yom Kippur. That when the Kohen Gadol said the Shem Havaya, we would bow down and we would say Baruch Shem Kavod. And the Marsha says that's not only Yom Kippur, that was every time the Shem Havaya was said, every single day. Yeah, it's a very, very beautiful idea. Of course, it's interesting that, so, the gematria of Amen is 91, and it's interesting, the gematria of Sukkah, the Sukkah, 
is also 91. And indeed, the, Bar the Baal Shem Tov says that the idea of a sukkah is a double hug from Hashem, both the Shem Adnus and the Shem Havaya. You're getting this double connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and that's the same idea as the, and the answering of Amen as, as well. <coughs> okay. But now, let's continue with the brachas. And uh, obviously, each bracha one could spend a lot of time on. But I want to focus on the bracha given to Yehuda. So Yaakov Avinu gave Yehuda a blessing. Lo yasur shevet mi Yehuda. The scepter of royal authority shall never depart from Yehuda. That Yaakov essentially made Yehuda the king of the Jewish people. And that actually means that the kings of the Jewish people will come from Yehuda. Again, via David HaMelech. I mean, David was not around then. Uh, but eventually, through David HaMelech, Mashiach. But it starts off with Yaakov Avinu designating Yehuda to have the scepter of authority, Lo Yosser Shevet, the Yehuda. So the Ramban has a very interesting discussion here about the Chashmonoim, right? We just uh, finished Hanukkah, and Hanukkah was the victory of the Maccabees, the Hasmoneans, over the Yavanim, and the Chashmonoim established a dynasty, a monarchy, that was an independent Jewish state for 103 years until the Romans came. And the Ramban raises a famous question, and that is, given the fact that the Maccabees were tzaddik emelion, they were willing to risk their lives, be Moser Nefesh, for Torah and for mitzvos. And remember, the Maccabean rebellion was not for political independence. It was to be able to keep the Torah. So they were righteous, they were tzaddikim. Why is it that the dynasty was simply annihilated? The Gemara says that eventually there was literally no survivor of the Hasmonean dynasty. And anyone that says they are descended from the Hasmoneans is a slave. Herod, for example. There were no survivors. They were wiped out. They were annihilated. Why should it be that such Sadiqim were annihilated? Or at least the later generations. And the Ramban says, because even the righteous Hashmonaim committed a sin, because after they achieved a military victory over the Yavanim, instead of <coughs> making themselves kings, they should have looked from some, for someone from the tribe of Yehuda, actually descended from David HaMelech, and they should have reestablished Malchus based on it. <coughs> and that was an Avera. It wasn't an Avera that they fought, and it wasn't an Avera that they achieved victory. They were the only ones who could do that, but they should not have assumed the monarchy <coughs> afterwards. And that was their Avera. Now the Rabban gives two reasons why it was sinful. Sin number one is because it's a violation of Yaakov Avinu's directive that Malchus belongs to Yehuda. <coughs> now it's interesting, by the way, it's not clear how logically what that means. It's very interesting. In other words, it's not a mitzvah in the Torah, kings must be from Yehuda. In other words, it's not God that said it. It's Yaakov said it to his children before he died. So if you, be, if you are a king other than from the tribe of Yehuda, are you transgressing a Torah law? What, what are you transgressing? So the Ramban kind of fudges it a little bit. The Ramban's Lashon is that the Malchei Chashmainai Ovru al tzavaat zakein. They transgressed the tzava'a of their grandfather. Now, it's not clear what that means. In other words, well, is that a violation of a Torah law? Like, what, what violation is that? In other words, I didn't carry out my grandfather's wishes. So halakhically, it's not clear. But the Ramban does say, obviously, it's an Avera because that's why Beis Chashmonai was wiped out. Now, he then gives another reason why it's an Avera, which has nothing to do with this, but I'll mention it anyway. And that is, even if you accept the legitimacy of kings other than Yehuda, the king cannot be a Kohen. 
There's a special iser for a Kohen to be a king because you have to have a separation, so to speak, between church and state. But for the opposite reason, as we might have it in the United States, in the United States, we separate church from state because we want to protect the government from religious influences. Now, obviously, that's not a Torah problem because the Torah wants a state to be religious. But rather, the issue is not that you want to protect the government from religion, but you want to protect religion from being contaminated by involvement in partisan politics. That when the Kohen is a religious leader, when the Kohen is involved in coalition building, horse trading, uh, concessions to, and the like for more money or whatever the advantage, what happens is they are no longer speaking with a pristine and pure religious orientation. They have other issues on the agenda. I don't want to be too specific, but, but this is indeed uh, the world of Israel uh, in which obviously uh, very, very religious uh, people are involved in, deeply involved in politics and there are certain costs. Now I understand the justification for it. I mean, they feel that the only way they could protect the interests of religious people is by being involved in the system. But one has to understand there's also a cost because when religion is outside of that system, it becomes a moral voice in which people respect. When it's part of that system, you're just another fighter. You're just another street fighter. So I have no particular reason to respect you more than anybody else. And as a result, uh, people often will compromise on some on fundamental principles or the like. So the Ramban gives us two different reasons, two opposite reasons why the Asmonean dynasty uh, was punished. One is because it wasn't Yehuda, and it has to be Yehuda. Uh, the other is because even if you don't need Yehuda, you can't have Kohanim. But I'm going to stick, uh, for the rest of our time, I'm going to stick with the first reason, that Malchus is given to Shevet Yehuda. Now it's interesting that Yehuda was not the only candidate for Melech. If we had to ask ourselves, who should be Melech? Maybe a logical uh, person to be Melech would be Yosef. Uh, because after all, Yosef did have the executive experience of running a state. And Yosef was a role model in terms of being righteous, even though he was living in Mitzrayim for so many years. And in reality, Yosef did have a certain aspect of Malchus, even in Eretz Yisrael, because, in fact, his Malchus was larger. When the ten tribes split off and founded their own kingdom, so the kings from the ten tribes tended to be from the tribe of Ephraim, who, of course, is from Yosef. So in a sense, the Malchus of Yerushalayim and the temple was always Malchus based David, that is from Shevet Yehuda. The Malchus of the Ten Tribes is Malchus of Yosef, Ephraim, which is Yosef. Uh, and indeed, before Mashiach ben David comes, there will be a Mashiach ben Yosef who will get killed. So it's a little bit more complicated. On, on one hand, yeah, the ultimate Malchus is Yehuda. David, Yehuda, Mashiach, that's Malchus based David, and yet, and yet, Malchus Yosef pops up a lot, whether it's the Ten Tribes, whether it's Mashiach ben Yosef, before Mashiach ben David comes. So what is the purpose of choosing Yehuda more than Yosef? So it's interesting, there's a medrash in last week's Parsha, on the Pasuk, Vayigash Vayigash a love Yehuda. That means Yehuda approached Yosef to plead for Binyamin. So the Medrash says this is evocative of a Pasuk in the prophet Amais, who says the following Hine Yomim Baim no Mashem. Behold, days are coming, those messianic days. Vinigash Choresh. Bikotzer, that the plower is going to meet up with the harvester. Now, 
Let's first understand the Pasuk simply before we get into drushas. The simple meaning of the Pasuk is this. We know that harvest occurs late spring and summer and plowing occurs the beginning of the winter, typically after the first rain in Cheshvan. So normally by the time you plow, there is no harvest. The harvest has already taken place. Hashem is promising that the fertility of the land will be so great that they'll still be harvesting when it's time to plow. The plower is going to bump into the harvester. So the pashtus of the Pasuk is fertility. The fertility will be so great that the harvest will keep on going past the summer into the beginning of the winter. But the Medrash gives a different twist on it. It says... Choresh, the plower, is called Yosef. And the, I'm sorry, Choresh is called Yehuda. The plower is called Yehuda. And the Kotzer is called Yosef. And the prophecy is that when Mashiach comes, Yosef, which means the ten tribes, will be reunited with Yehuda, the two tribes, Yehuda and Binyamin. And this is foreshadowed in Vayigash Elav Yehuda, that Yehuda, just like in Mitzrayim, Yehuda approaches Yosef. In Messianic era, the ten tribes are going to be reunited with Yehuda and Binyamin, the two tribes. And it's based on this metaphor that Yosef is called the harvester and Yehuda is called the plower. Right, so you understand that this is a messianic prophecy about the reunification of Yosef and Yehuda as just like it took place in Mitzrayim, it will take place with the ten tribes being reunited with Am Yisrael. So here's the question. Why would it be so that Yehuda is called the plower and Yosef is called the harvester? What is the significance of those designations? So we have... Um, a beautiful explanation from the Avne Nezer. The Avne Nezer was a great, great Hasidic Rebbe who died at the very beginning of the 20th century. And um, he was a very interesting person in this way. He was, not, he was a great, great Hasidic Rebbe, but he also was indisputably one of the Gedolim of the Poskim of the generation. And all, all people considered him to be one of the Gedolim Hador Mamish. And although he knew Kala Torah Kula, his specialty was Hilcha Shabbos. He wrote one of the great classic svarim, analytical svarim, on Hilcha Shabbos that's called the Egle Tal. The reason I'm telling you this is because he's going to explain Chorish and Kotzer by reference to Shabbos concepts. He says, we know that plowing is one of the 39 malachas of Shabbos. And harvesting is one of the malachas of Shabbos, right? These are one of the 39 malachas. What's the definition of plowing? Crushing the earth to make it softer and more receptive for planting. Right? That's what plowing is. You know, you're breaking up clods of earth so it gets softer and it's more pliable and, and it can absorb seeds. So plowing is softening the ground. Harvesting is halachically defined as oker davar migidulo, uprooting something from its source of growth. I pick a fruit, I pick a plant, I pick a flower. It was growing from the ground. When I separate it from the ground, that is considered harvesting. That's why, for example, picking mushrooms on Shabbos technically is not harvesting because mushrooms do not grow from the ground. They don't have roots. Uh, mushrooms really get their nourishment primarily from the air or whatever, whatever it would be. So it turns out, choresh, plowing, is softening the ground. Kotzer is detachment from the ground. Right? Halachati, that's your definition. So says the Avni Nezer, if you understand this definition, you can understand why Yehuda is called the plower and Yosef is called the harvester. Dirt, ground, symbolically refers to a person's Yetzir Hara. 
a person has taivas, a person has lusts, a person has pulls for material comfort or pleasure. That's called chumriyot. Chumriyot means earthiness. Gashmiyot, even the word gashmiyot means materialism. Now, Yehuda, well, let's take Yosef first. Yosef detached himself. Yosef is the harvester. He detached his spiritual essence from desire and taiva. When Yosef is tempted with Potiphar's wife, Yosef just says no. Yosef doesn't give in. Yosef separates himself from his earthly nature. That's why he's called the harvester. He takes his mitziot and he uproots himself from all of the earthiness that might drag him down. Yehuda, on the other hand, when Yehuda is subject to a very similar sexual temptation, Yehuda gives in. Yehuda and Tamar, he gives in to a woman he thinks is a prostitute. So the difference between Yehuda and Yosef is when faced with sexual temptations, for example, Yosef just says no. That's like harvesting. Yehuda, on the other hand, fails, but then through repentance and introspection, he softens up his earthiness and dedicates it back to HaKadosh Baruch. Yehuda represents the one who fails and teaches us how to do tshuva. Yosef represents the one who is so perfect that he does not fail. So with this understanding, perhaps we can see why Malchus is given to Yehuda more than Yosef. A Melech, and of course we've had kings that were no good, I mean certainly we've had Rishayim, but the ideal Melech, like David Melech, in fact David Melech himself, followed Yehuda's model in so many ways. Yehuda was Nichshal with Tamar, David was Nichshal with Bathsheba. Same type of temptation. Now, whether Bathsheba was technically married or not, that, that's not relevant to this discussion, but he certainly was nichshal with being with her. Uh, Yehuda was willing to admit that he was guilty not to embarrass Tamar. So too, David admits that he was guilty of a sin. He could have given all sorts of excuses. David admits to the Navi, I'm guilty. So the combination of strong earthiness that pulls you in a, in a wrong direction, coupled with the honesty to acknowledge your fault, to do tshuva and make it better, as opposed to Yosef who simply doesn't fail. A melech is supposed to be a role model. A melech is supposed to be an inspiration. A melech is supposed to be a guide and a teacher, something that we look up to. But sometimes to look up to a person who is so perfect that he never makes a mistake, that may not be the ideal leader for me because he's so much above me. You know, there's a whole genre of Gedolim biographies. These are biographies written about the great, great rabbis. Uh, you know, whether it's the Chavitz Chaim, the Vilna Gaon, or modern rabbis, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, Rabbi Kamineski, Rabbi Yoshev, Rabbi Yosef. Right? And more and more biographies are written all the time about all of these great rabbis. And, you know, uh, by and large, it's worthwhile reading. I, I actually enjoy uh, reading them myself. And I learn a lot. Some of them are really beautiful, beautiful books. But Rav Huttner already in the 1970s. It's interesting. I don't think there's a biography of Rav Huttner, which is interesting why there wouldn't be. But okay, that's... But Rav Huttner remarked in the 1970s when this genre was kind of beginning that he felt that some aspects of the way the biographies were written were a disservice. Because they were painting these gadolim as superhuman geniuses who never made a mistake and never had a struggle. So a typical biography would say when he was four years old, he knew the whole Babylonian Talmud by heart. And when he was five, he finished the Zohar. And when he was six, you show me. And you're reading these stories about these amazing kids, these super geniuses who learned, you know, 21 hours a day, um, you know, and, uh, when, they were, when, they were, when they were three years old, and then they would take a little break for nursing or something. You know, 
And the footers claim was, on one hand, you read them and you, you know, you're amazed. It's like reading, like, you know, amazement. You know, um, what's your Guinness Book of World Records or Ripley's Believe It or Not type of thing. But the footer says, what does that say to you? What does that tell you? What do you tell your children? We, we're not like, we're not going to be that. We're not going to do that. What do we learn from that, actually? But Rav Huttner said, the mistake is that Gedolim were not born Gedolim. At least some of them weren't. They also had struggles. They also had difficulties. They also made mistakes. You know, we know the Chavitz Chaim when he was 80 or 90 or older, in which he was so meticulous on the laws of Lashon Hara that if he spoke Lashon Hara in his presence, he would fall asleep. He trained himself to fall asleep. So, like an amazing thing. He had control over his body to fall asleep. But what was the Chavitz Chaim at 15? Did he have those struggles? Now, granted, halachically, there may be an issue of Lashon Hara. Are you allowed to write negative things about people? Okay, that, that's an interesting halachic issue. But Rav Huttner said, in reality, we would learn much more by seeing how a great person struggled with difficulties and maybe even sometimes failed but then came back with tshuva and dedication because that's something I can relate to. I can say, oh, wow. He failed. I fail. He came back. I can come back. This is also a pedagogic and even a parenting tool, although you have to be careful how to use it. Let's say your kid is going through a difficult period. Questions of emuna, or just difficulty in school. One of the things you might want to do, although you have to be cautious with this, is sometimes you may want to open up and talk about a struggle that you yourself had when you were that child's age. You know? And even though that means maybe you're tarnishing the perfect image, of course kids don't think parents are perfect anyway, but the perfect image and the like. But sometimes the way you help a person is by showing them that you too struggled. Teach her exactly the same way. Now it is true that teachers may not want to talk about all the stuff they did as teenagers or younger. But on the other hand, you can't underestimate how powerful a pedagogic tool that is when the Rebbe tells the student, I did exactly what you did. You know, I climbed on the roof and went through a whatever, whatever, whatever shtick uh, would be involved. And the kid can see. So, what's interesting is Hashem wants as a king for the Jewish people not a king that is so perfect that he never fails but a king who even though he fails can teach us how to come back from failure. Because the first is something beyond me. And the second is something I can relate to and I can learn from. Because I fail and I make mistakes. And I have to be shown that you can come back. You can grow. That mistakes are not final. Things can be made good. Things can be repaired. You see, the person who never breaks anything may not be the model for people who break things. But the person who can break something and fix it, that's a good model because that's a skill that I'll be able to incorporate. And this is part of the idea, therefore, that the malchus has to go to the plower who is still connected to the earth and not to the coatser, not to the harvester who is disconnected from the earth. And in reality, if you think about it, if you just look at the whole history and even the future lineage of the messianic line, uh, you will actually see that throughout Malchus based of it and Moshiach, there is this undercurrent of sexual impropriety that is always there. Let's look at it every site. Uh, first of all, let's start with Rus, right? Rus the Moabite is the great grandmother of David Amalek. So Moshiach comes from Rus, the Moabite convert. Rus is from Moab. Now what is Moab? Lot, after Sodom was destroyed, had an incestuous relationship with his two daughters. 
And the child from the older daughter was called Moab from my father. So Rus herself comes from that incest. And Rus and Boaz, their union, was surreptitious at night. Right, Boaz was even embarrassed that uh, no one should... See. Well, I, I, I want to clear. They didn't consummate it that way, but, 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 but she came to him uh, in the middle of the night, and uh, he was very frightened, and he actually made her leave before dawn, so nobody should think that a woman came to the threshing floor. So there was that appearance of impropriety. And then we have David and Bathsheba, now remember, from David and Bathsheba comes Shlomo. And the Rambam says Mashiach is not only descended from David, but Mashiach is also descended from Shlomo. From that, David had many sons, but descended from that particular son. So there's always this appearance of impropriety in Malchus based David. Because Hashem is showing us that imperfection can exist within greatness. And one should never feel that because they're flawed, because they're broken, they cannot achieve closeness to Hashem. It's a very important lesson. Uh, what is the, um, I think this is a song by Leonard Cohen, also an inter interesting Jewish uh, fellow, uh, who had some Orthodox connections in his life. Uh, he said, uh, when you have a crack uh, in the bell, that lets the light in. And the notion is that the crack, the awareness of my inadequacies, the awareness of my failures, the awareness of my mistakes, can actually give me humility. And in that humility, you can feel the presence of God in a very, very powerful way. In some ways, Rav Tzaddik writes, the Tzaddik who never sins is a wonderful thing. But there's an occupational hazard of a tzaddik who never sins. And that's arrogance, potential arrogance. The one who fails can no longer be arrogant because he knows he fails. So on one level, of course, better not to sin than to sin, <laughs> for sure. On the other level, the sinner who makes mistakes and does tshuva has the blessing of knowing their limitations and being humble and in that humility there can be a greater connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So this is kind of the deeper meaning why Malchus comes from Shevet Yehuda, David HaMelech, who is called the Choresh, the plower, rather than Yosef, who is called the, the harvester. Uh, but Be'ezer Hashem, uh, as I say, there will be a Mashiach ben Yosef before there'll be a Mashiach ben David. And according to uh, rabbinic tradition, there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot about Mashiach ben Yosef. It's very fragmentary. But Mashiach ben Yosef is going to be killed in the pre-Messianic wars of Gog and Magog. But the Vilna Gaon says that that's not inevitable. Through tshuva and masim tovim, we could avoid the death of Mashiach ben Yosef. And then it would be possible that you'd actually have Mashiach ben Yosef serving under Mashiach ben David. In other words, uh, all of the nevuas that Mashiach ben Yosef will be destroyed is a worst case scenario. But that worst case scenario is not necessarily going to be inevitable. This is a teaching of the Vilna Gaon. Another teaching of the Vilna Gaon, which is quite frightening, is that the Vilna Gaon says that the pre-Messianic war of Gog and Magog will only last 12 minutes. And for 250 years, nobody understood what type of war could last for 12 minutes. Unfortunately, now we do know what type of war could last for 12 minutes. That would be a nuclear war. So that's the worst case scenario, but, but indeed that is a scenario. Moreover, the Vilna Gaon said, more than 250 years ago, that when uh, Russia moves into the Crimea, it's time to put on your Shabbos clothes in honor of Mashiach. So the Vilna Gaon had some sense that Russia invading 
uh, to the uh, to the east. Uh, I'm sorry, to the uh, yeah. Uh, well, whatever. Well, 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 you know, the Ukraine and the like. My map is getting mixed up. Is also a harbinger of Mashiach. So, if you combine those two predictions, one is the invasion of Crimea, and the other is nuclear war. You get a scary combination of Gog and Magog that we hope we can avoid. But then you have the third teaching of the Gra that all of this can be avoided with Tshuva and Masam Tov. So, so, so we have three different teachings of the Gra that kind of intersect. One is Russia invading Crimea is a sign of Moshiach. Two is the war will only be 12 minutes, which is nuclear, probably. The third is that everything can be avoided and circumvented and cut short by Tshuva, Masim Tovim, and Avat Yisrael. So in a sense, the third step can mitigate the severity of the first two steps. So B'Yash Hashem, we hope that we will experience the Gula in the latter way rather than Chas V'Shalom in the other ways. So thank you for coming and you have a good day, good chance. Thank you.